Well, here we go again on another ride around the Carolinas to rekindle some old friendships with some special people. Tonight, three... Get him. Go get that cat. Go get him, boy. Showing people what they do. You know there's heat there. Ooh, man, oh man. Golly. Hello, I'm CJ Underwood, and I am sitting here with some of my oldest friends as we reminisce <laughs> about the great days of Carolina Camera, a special human interest feature that was produced on WBTV oh, over a couple of decades. It's been some time since we've seen those stories, but uh, let me introduce my friends here. Mark Garrison, of course, my old chum, Bill Ballard, who I've known, the first guy I guess I met when I came to Charlotte in the late 60s, John Carter, my current uh, colleague at WBTV, we all have something in common. We all uh, reported and produced that Carolina camera uh, feature for, for a long time. Many of us on many different occasions mm -hmm. over those 20 years. Uh, history. You guys want to say something about the history or you want to leave it to the granddaddy here? Well, I yes. can make a comment about that, <laughs> yeah. but you are the granddaddy. That's, that's true. <laughs> but uh, if you recall, it started on Labor Day, 1970. Yeah. And you and John Steed, photographer John Steed, produced the very first one. And I'm not even sure in those early days that it was planned to go three days a week. We had no idea how many we could produce. Well, actually, um, the way it actually started was I had uh, covered the legislature in 68 and general news, and I was looking for some way to get an assignment that was a lot easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> you still are. And, yeah. you know, uh -huh. I mean, I've always been looking for the easy way out, you know. Yeah. And I went to uh, our uh, assistant news director, who was John. John Edgerton at the time, and uh, way back, and Irv Melton was head in the department. Boy, these are really way back. And uh, I proposed that uh, we ought to be able to do something like Charlie Kiralt, our dear late friend, was doing on CBS, and that the Carolinas were just a terrific place for finding stories like that. Why couldn't we maybe try that? And so uh, I was told to go out and maybe shoot four or five stories, and we'd see how it goes. Like, where would we go from there after we do the first few? and we'd see how it would fly. And uh, it just happened that it coincided with September of 1970 when we went on the air with our first hour-long newscast, the first mm -hmm. ever in the mm -hmm. Carolinas, which meant we had a little time for a special kind of feature. We got three and a half minutes. You guys remember a three and a half minute story? Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me tell you what. Not recently. Not in, today, in. but uh, we did that and um, we started off with about six or eight stories. And we did run them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I sort of wondered, well, golly, I've sort of uh, covered all I can find. I wonder what I'm going to do next. And the response was the amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Once these were on the air, people got to see the flavor and the, the mm -hmm. colorful characters and places mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. happy stories. Uh, we started getting letters. And people started sending clippings from their hometown paper about yes. a favorite guy and his great story. And we plagiarized a lot of newspapers, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we sure and did. and we got did. off and running. <laughs> yeah. So that basically the history of it is um, the readers responded, the viewers responded, uh, sending us great ideas for future stories, and we kept on going. And I lasted uh, into 72 about 250 stories. And then who came along? Wow. I followed you. Yeah. Be before we talk about what I did, I want to ask you a question about the, the early days. Was it always called Carolina Camera from the very first? Somehow we landed on that name right off the bat. Wow. Uh, and it just seemed Carolina and Camera went together. So it did. It was right from yeah. the start. Yeah. Well, I recall following you in 72 when you left to go to Carowinds for a couple of years as mm -hmm. a public relations yep. person. Matter of fact, the very first story I ever did was on Where Is CJ Going? <laughs> yeah. And we did the interview out at Carowinds. Yes, it that was... Uh, quite a time. I, I, I felt like I had done all there was to do in TV news and the big park was coming up and I knew the uh, the founder, Pat Hall, and uh, was tempted to try that. I lasted 18 months and quickly got back to <laughs> what I knew how to do better and been there ever since. But we had a succession of people on, mm -hmm. on the assignment. Sure after did. you? Well, after you, after me, was you. Yeah, well, you I came did. back. I, I came back and did another couple of hundred or whatever mm -hmm. and then other duties called. But the great thing was we established something that the viewers really took to, and, and it was obvious that it, it found a place. Mm -hmm. 
And I think really in the long run, the stories and the atmosphere and, and what we created there were bigger than any one reporter and it, it had to do oh, with Oh, absolutely. It, it absolutely. was keep those stories coming. And it was a time in the 70s and into the 80s when people just love those, those stories. Yeah. And we had plenty of, uh, plenty of material to keep us going. Absolutely. But to tell you how timeless they are, I had a call from a woman uh, a few months ago who remembered a story I had done 10 years ago wow. and found my name in the telephone directory oh, cool. and called and wanted to know if she could still get directions on how to get there. Oh, wow. That is and I've, so, had, I've had the same thing happen to me, especially the places where you went to eat. That was, uh, that was always oh, a big boy. draw. We always got good response for that. But you know, you talked about the letters and everything. I never had any trouble finding stories. I, to, to this day, you know, I think I, if we started it up again, Oh, you can yeah, people just there. all, they're just all, it's amazing how many different stories there are out there. Which isn't to say that we didn't ever duplicate one another. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we did I a mean, lot of updates on old stories. Well, I think even this Blenheim uh, ginger ale here, right. you, uh, uh, Mark, you and CJ both did both a did story on, on the Blenheim ginger yeah. ale. And in fact, here. it was always kind of disheartening to get to a story and you think, man, I have stumbled onto a great story here. And Blenheim ginger ale is a great story because it's the smallest bottling plant in yeah. the United States yeah. and it's nasty. I mean, it's dirty. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's yeah. not. <laughs> It's still hot. Yeah. The FDA and might it's not very approved. hot. And, and I got down there, and we did this nice story, and then the guy said, tell CJ we said hello. He was down here a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they've done that story. Yeah. Well, but yeah, their stories were so good, most of them, you could do them over again two or three years, yeah, like a brand really new story. Could. What uh, what what made a good Carolina camera, though? What criteria uh, did you use? Well, you know, to me, it was a person. There were a lot of ways to do a great story. The, the place you might go to an event like the uh, Spivey's Corner, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the hollering the contest, hollering contest mm -hmm. or, or an event. Because Carolina's full of festivals and events. You can do one of those every other week. Uh, but I love to sit down with a colorful guy mm -hmm. who, could, who could talk in a colorful language and show you how to do something with his hands. Carve birds, you know, make, make knives. Who knows what? Mm -hmm. But I love to have those stories where it was all right there in front of me with a great character. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the reasons you could do more than one story on an individual because most of the time those individuals were so broad and so deep, sure. even in three and a half minutes, you couldn't really approach uh, how colorful they really were. Yeah. What about you, Mark? What, did, what, 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 would, what would make you decide on doing a story? Well, I, I, I think just if I uh, heard about it and thought it sounded interesting. Uh, when We did a book of some stories that I had done back yeah. in 86, and I said in the foreword to that that I just sort of consider myself a professional visitor. And so <laughs> if, that if, and if, and if it just sounded interesting to me, then I thought, well, heck, that'll make a good story. Because it really is about ordinary people exactly. and their ordinary. pursuits, what makes them yeah. tick, why they have this hobby or... Or collect this or do that and so it, it, it was I think if it interested me and I thought it sounded pretty interesting I figured everybody else would be interested and you in know it. the only way you really knew or could sense that it would be a good story because a lot of these folks are 50 75 miles away you can't right. just uh, go and decide oh yeah we'll come back tomorrow and do the story if it's good uh, I always just listen very carefully and ask a lot of questions on the phone mm -hmm. when we were contacting mm -hmm. them that I knew would be like the questions we'd probably do in the interview. Exactly. And you could tell then that you had a pretty good character coming up or somebody who would work well in a story. But you know, we, we went to all of these stories sight unseen. Yeah. When you arrived, what you, you saw what was you, what, you, what got. you got. And it was amazing to me that 99 <laughs> times out of 100, we could come away with a good well, story. Well, only one time did we have a story set up that completely bombed. And I did several hundred as well as you. And there was a story about a dog that rode a skateboard. <laughs> I know another, I know another story about a dog. <laughs> well, when we got there, that dog wouldn't even get near the skateboard. And the owner just kept going, honest, the dog will do it, we'll do it. And we kept trying to roll footage and get the dog over. The dog never got to the skateboard. And that, But out of all the stories that we did, that's the only one that ever fell through. So, but as we were leaving that day, George Williams, the photographer, said, don't you ever bring me on another animal story. <laughs> Well, mine, mine is, uh, is similar to that. We went up to a place up in the mountains where the guy supposedly could call fish, and oh. they would respond oh. verbally. Verbally, call fish. We stayed there for hours and never saw a fish. <laughs> it's one of the few times that it didn't turn into a story. Yeah. And those are the times when you go back and you start begging and say, 
is it okay if we don't do three stories this week? Can we just do two yeah, this right, week? Yeah, yeah. Well, right. what about you? Do you have a criterion for a... No, well, I, mine was more or less along the lines of Mark's. If it sounded interesting to me, I figured, you know, I'm pretty common fella, average, ordinary, <laughs> whatever, and other fellows would like it too. But I, I was particularly, the, the individual kind of stories particularly yeah, appealed yeah. to me, those, those about the people that were just ordinary but may have been doing something really interesting that sort of made them stand out a little bit and they weren't doing it for glory or for, for any other reason other than they just enjoyed it. And I think when you show people doing things that they enjoy themselves, other folks have got to enjoy it too. You know, and, and it's more so than say movie stars and, and big names and all and everybody's sort of interested by them. But. Of course, one major ingredient had to be visual. I mean, you know, oh, after yes, all, yes, this is yes, television, uh, so, uh, you know, it couldn't be a good radio story. We wanted to see something happen, and mm -hmm. so generally they were all, uh, uh, it was quite important that somebody be doing something or we'd see something come from the beginning to the end. Yes. And I think that's what made the best stories. Also, it may be because I'm just closer to some of them's age that I did stories with. <laughs> but I really do feel like the best stories that I did, or at least the ones that affected me personally, were with people that had lived a pretty good time on this earth mm -hmm. and could tell you about yeah. life. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to live a certain amount of time before you can talk yeah, about life. That's yes. a great story. And, right. And the ones that reflect the culture of the Carolinas, too, I think. They, exactly. they, it makes this area so unique because they reflected mm -hmm. that. And, and as, they, as they get older and as some of those people who've died, who we've all done stories on, we don't have that like we used to, say, in, in mm -hmm. that same... Uh, uh, criteria as such. So I, I felt it was interesting too that that we were providing a look at the real culture of what North Carolina was all about and South Carolina was all yeah, about. As a matter of fact, uh, back in those early days, uh, we won a big prize from the Travel and Tourism Department, a Nesbitt mm. Award. Big clock, I've got it on my piano at home. Oh, uh, that's, uh, where that oh yeah, that's where it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> we even got a reputation that went to Raleigh and, uh, and won a big award because actually what we were doing was sort of promoting that Exactly. This is the way North Carolinians live, and there's no other place in the country like it. No, there isn't. You know, a couple of other guys spent some time on Carolina camera. Andrew Shore, who went to UNC Chapel Hill, and Ken Udy, who was from Oakboro. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, where is he these days, you know? Well, Ken is uh, in the Raleigh area, I believe, and Andrew Shore is uh, out on the West Coast somewhere, and I think they might have a little something to say about this themselves. Yeah. I'm Ken Udy. In 1979, I took the Carolina camera torch from Andrew Shore. For most of my career in journalism, I was a political reporter, and for much of that time, I reported from Raleigh, the capital city, covering the state legislature and statewide political campaigns. I left WBTV in 1981 and became chief political writer of the Charlotte Observer. In 1987, I moved to Raleigh, and I've been here ever since. I operate a public relations firm called Capital Strategies. They asked me to tell you why I enjoyed Carolina Camera so much. The answer is easy. It was like being on vacation. Where else can you report to work in the morning and they give you a tank of gas, a camera, a road map of the Carolinas, and they tell you to come back and give the interesting stories. Stories about heroes and hustlers, artisans, musicians, and sometimes the offbeat characters. In 1980, we produced a story about the presidential candidates who had really long shot campaigns for the presidency. I remember interviewing Alec Brock, who then was the director of the State Elections Board. He said to me, Ken, you know, the compulsion to run for public office is akin only to the compulsion for alcohol and sex. I think there was a lot to be said for that statement. Many of our travels took us to the low country of South Carolina. I remember once we followed a crew from the South Carolina Wildlife Division. We spent a day on the golf course but I can assure you we weren't looking for birdies or eagles. There is this group of hardy characters who work for the South Carolina Wildlife Department. On first glance, you might think their job of fishing is as cushy as the marshmallows they sometimes use for bait, until you see what they fish for, alligators. Gary Hill and his crew call them nuisance alligators, gators that come up from the swamp and take sun baths in backyards or gators that pose an added water hazard like this hole on the golf course at the Kiowa Island Resort. Alligators have become a nuisance since the federal government declared them a protected species. It's against the law to kill an alligator. Only people like those on Gary's crew can even touch them. Not that many people want to. Let's come on and uh, get the rope fixed up and try to catch him out. He's done spooked. 
These men catch about 100 gators a year, alligators that are native to South Carolina. Sometimes the marshmallows and poles don't work. Gators get tired of marshmallows, and they aren't known for their cooperation with people. In those cases, the crew brings out a rope and tries to lasso the gators. Easy. 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 Walk on back. Easy. Don't bounce it. We have went um, for three or four summers, not regular, but off and on, and uh, before we could ever capture some of them. It didn't take that long to capture this one, only three passes. Drop it down easy. Now hold it. Walk back now. Now! There is excitement in catching alligators at perhaps is a cross between landing a blue marlin and roping a steer at a rodeo. The men didn't try to hide their excitement as they stretched rubber bands over the gator's mouth and measured him. This one was seven feet four inches, and he was not happy about being caught. Gary Hill says alligators never are. A good many years ago, Officer Wages and myself was in a boat catching from the boat, and the pole bent up, and the gator mm -hmm. a few times tried to get in the boat with us. What'd you do? We just kept beating him off with the, I kept beating him off with the boat paddle. At another hole on the golf course, Allison Pinckney took command. He's back on it. All right, now you got him. Come this way with it. Oh. Bring, it the bring the noose, Eddie, because... Gary, bring the noose, because it's down behind his body. They're about as fast as any daggone thing that you can think of. Not only are alligators fast, they are strong. It took four men to hold this one down to secure his jaws, to measure and tag him. Then it's off to the crew's trailer where alligators don't take kindly to sharing space. And finally, the gators go home to the swamp. They are in a hurry to get back in. Well, I'll ask you something now. Are you afraid of these things? Uh, no, sir, but I got a lot of respect for them. It is because of that respect that all the members of the crew still have five fingers and five toes. <laughs> That's another one that won't give us any problems. Ken Udy with the Carolina Camera. If you've been out this way in the Pacific Northwest, far from Charlotte, North Carolina, you'll recognize that as the Space Needle in Seattle, Washington. I'm Andrew Shore. A long way from my original home in Charlotte, now, gosh, 20 years later, I think, I live here, and I have for about 10 years. I was the Carolina Camera correspondent in the late 70s and did, I think, about 300 Carolina Camera stories, following C.J. Underwood and Bill Ballard, and preceding, I think it was, Ken Udy, and I had a great time doing it. I want to tell you about that, but first, since we've come all the way to Seattle, let me show you around. Downtown Seattle. The Space Needle, original uh, World's Fair, World's Exposition back in 1962, and Puget Sound, which is what's responsible for our gray weather. The clouds are so low here, they say you have to stoop, and today is an example of that, and you probably wouldn't believe me if I said that it was bright sunshine and blue skies yesterday, but we weren't out of here yesterday, so we couldn't take advantage of that. I love living here. After doing Carolina Camera in Charlotte, I did a program called PM Magazine in Charlotte and then eventually became a national producer in San Francisco. Found my way via Los Angeles up to the Northwest where now no longer a single person as I was in Charlotte. I have a wife and three kids. And if I look a little tired, I was up very late last night with kid number three who's just six months old. But enough about my personal life. Let's talk about Carolina Camera back in the late 70s. It was a delight. We traveled throughout North and South Carolina. And I guess my special joy was doing stories that were airborne. 
We learned to fly. I got my pilot's license while doing Carolina Camera. We were in balloons, we were in helicopters, we went in jet fighter planes, and we also tended to do things that were kind of daring. Hang gliding, uh, went down the rapids and uh, kayaking with about 10 minutes of training beforehand, but met some wonderful people throughout the Carolinas. And so I guess my greatest memory is just how wonderful the people are back in that part of the country. We don't have quite the characters here in the Northwest that you tend to have in the Carolinas, and I really miss it. But it was really fun meeting people who would do remarkable things. Seattle, of course, is the home of Boeing, and I love it because I like uh, aircraft so much. And one kind of aircraft we got to go in with the Carolina camera uh, was a helicopter. And we found this helicopter flight training center in Saluda, South Carolina. God knows why it's there. But we found it, asked the owner whether we could do a Carolina camera story about why it's there and who comes there to train in helicopters. And of course, we got to fly the helicopters ourselves, so that was a real treat. And I remember that one of the fellows who was training there, I think was the audio engineer or lighting engineer for the Eagles, the famous rock group, and had come all the way from Los Angeles to Saluda to be trained flying a helicopter there. So we had quite an experience that day, and I'd like to show you that. Why Saluda? Because it's the helicopter center of the southeast. Well, why is it here? because of this man, Les Hemble, a helicopter pioneer who likes living in his family's plantation house and having his work right on the front lawn. And why do I want to try it? Because I've learned to fly an airplane and want to find out for all of us if this is much different. The things that will be similar are, for instance, the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and certain pieces of radio equipment, and also in the flight controls. The pedals on which you have your feet and the stick you have in your hand are quite similar to those you've been using in the airplane. The extra thing that the helicopter has is this handle over on this side, which has the remarkable capability of when I raise it up, the helicopter goes up, and when I lower it, the helicopter comes down. We're starting off in a Hughes 500, an aircraft that costs $250 an hour to fly and is definitely not your typical trainer. But Les thought it might be fun for us to go in a jet turbine and go first class. Okay, we'll let uh, a running uh, takeoff here and get into an airborne mode. Our uh, airspeed going up here to 40 miles an hour. It's a lot like riding a magic carpet, zooming around with just an ever so slight movement of your wrist. Okay, you're flying the helicopter. Put your feet on the pedals and fly the helicopter at 60 knots, which you see there in the outside circle. And if you want to make a turn, just bank to the left like you would an airplane. And you can do that right now. And just come on around to the right. The helicopter is like a bicycle in that it turns when you bank it. How am I doing? You're doing just great. I think I can solo you tomorrow. Uh, okay. If we fly all night tonight. Okay. Now, it's really not too difficult, not for me and probably not for you. That is, as long as an expert like Les is sitting in the right seat. I sometimes tell the students that the helicopter is like a mule, and it's going to take it a little while to get used to a new driver. It's not that the driver needs to get used to the helicopter. It's the other way around. Of course, the great thing about helicopters is they can hover go nowhere but still fly. It looks like the easiest thing to do, but it's really the most difficult. We say that the helicopter is like a rattlesnake, and that it sits there so quietly, looks like it isn't doing anything, but yet you will recognize that the least bit of inattention, it will strike you just like a rattlesnake. And it takes just about two seconds to go from a nice, flying, hovering helicopter to a crash helicopter flying peacefully on the runway. I was glad the rattlesnake didn't bite this time and found the helicopter to be the most fun way to get around that I've tried yet. If only I could afford it. That was amazing. Couldn't have done much better if we'd have known what we were doing. Flying in this $100,000 jet helicopter sure be going to assignments every once in a while in our little old airplane. You don't even need airport. Maybe my boss will let us make the switch. I'll have to work on it. In the meantime, I'll just say, this is Andrew Shore with a Carolina camera flying over Saluda, South Carolina.
And, you know, the interesting thing is that you always get a chance to see people in front of the camera. You never get a chance to see people behind the scenes. And tonight, we want you to meet people behind the scenes, like Joe Travis. Joe, tell us how the concept of the Carolina Camera Reunion started. Well, I basically got the idea from the Charles Corralt replay that's on uh, cable television now. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be a great idea to take the maybe three or four thousand stories and, and put them together into like a, a reunion show and, and, and give people a chance to see some of the stories that may have missed them. They may have not lived in the area or uh, uh, were too young to remember. Um, and we also have photographer Brad Stafford here. Tell uh, the folks at home, which hosts did each of you all work with? Uh, I started, when I started in 1977, it was the first time I shot for Carolina Camera. Mm -hmm. And I started with Andrew Shore. Uh, you saw him on the uh, screen just a few minutes ago. He's and they were still using film in, in 1977, in right? 77, yes. And, and, and that, that's obviously very, very different from, from live television and, and being able to bring a tape in, put it in the machine, and, and getting it to the people in split-second timing. How, how different was film versus the way we do television today? Uh, one of the primary things is you're a little tighter budget because uh, with videotape, uh, we generally shoot about a 20-minute cassette at a time. Well, our longest roll of film was a 400-foot reel, and it ran about nine minutes. So you kind of had to hurry up and get a story so done. So we had to do our stories a little more concisely because of that. Set it up, do all the setup, and not wait a long time for it to happen? Yes, and try not to do too many retakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I know you guys have got some great behind-the-scenes stories, right? I mean, you've <laughs> got to have some favorite stories that you actually did. Because you did stories on animals and people and places and food, but you know what kind of stories really, really, um, you know, spoke to your heart? I think the stories that I liked uh, were the ones that were about people that either enjoyed what they were doing with their life, and, and, and in other words, they had a hobby that they made into a living. Mm -hmm. And every day they got up and they just, you know, they loved every minute of it. And they enjoyed sharing with people. Yeah, and yeah. and the other one, the other kind of stories were the ones that were about people that may not be famous, but they did stuff for other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're going to be hearing some great behind-the-scenes stories, some more, but right now we're going to continue with some of those wonderful clips, and uh, we have more photographers to introduce you to later, and don't forget C.J. Underwood, John Carter, Mark Garrison, they're all here to share their favorite stories with you, people who have lived in the Carolinas for years, and we're here to reminisce. You know, I was saying earlier that, uh, as far as I was concerned, the people made the stories. Oh, yeah. But there were some occasions where the place was very important. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, we um, took a week once and went to Myrtle Beach, mm. down to the, to the Grand Strand area, and had set up ahead of time some ghost stories. You know, there are famous ghost oh, stories absolutely. all along that area. Yeah. You know, the Alice <laughs> Flag story, the Hermitage. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a funeral home. It used to be a funeral home in uh, Conway, South Carolina. It was now this big house with big railings all the way around. It was a typical southern gorgeous home. And the occupant, the man of the house, was happened to be a former funeral director. <laughs> but they had a little girl in this house who presented herself every once in a while in ghost-like form. And the story was that she had been there in the military family. And she had a closet downstairs that was now the bathroom. And she had little dresses that she would always try on. Well, the goldfinches were the names. They, they told us that every once in a while, they would hear the sound of coat hangers falling in this converted bathroom. And uh, we were very serious about it. And that every once in a while uh, would see something that would look like the shape of this little girl. And the first day they ever moved into the house, the son of the house uh, came in to mom and said, Mom, who was that little girl that just walked by the window upstairs? And she oh. said, there's nobody in here, nobody in here. Well, this story left me in chills. We went on down to the beach after we did that particular story, and we had been in the front foyer area uh, shooting some eerie photography and up the stairs and creating a little eerie effect, you know, with photography. And uh, the lady of the house, we told her where we were going to be at Motel at Myrtle Beach. Well, the phone rang, and it was the lady of the house calling. She said, I thought you would like to know that about 10 minutes after you left, a section of plaster in the <laughs> ceiling right over the foyer where you were filming fell into the floor. Oh, my. It always happens after you leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and, and I remember.
remember the lady in the end of the story. I said, do you believe in ghosts? Now, come on. She said, well, no, but I have developed a healthy respect for the supernatural. <laughs> you know, you're talking of... about the beach. Ooh. One of my favorite places that I went, and this one didn't have a thing to do with anybody because we didn't talk to a soul. But photographer Charlie Hemrick and I wanted to wonder to each other, what are the Outer Banks like in mm. January? Uh. And particularly right before sunrise, mm. what would it look like? And he did a marvelous job photographically of, of, of depicting that, and I tried to put a few words together with it, but that was quite a time. And I'll tell you, the Outer Banks at sunrise in January can be a cool place. Wow. <laughs> Truly wow. Carolina. Huh? Yeah. It was. You got a place? I, you know, I, I loved everywhere I went. I didn't, there was never a place I went that I didn't like, but I would have to say, you know, if I had to say where it was, it was probably the mountains. Mm -hmm. That I like going oh, yeah. to the best, and and we went to a lot of places up in the mountain. We went to the typical places. We went to Biltmore House. Spoke to the owner of the house. You know, it's privately owned. Oh. Went to Ghost Town and did a story on the gentleman there who's been the sheriff there for years and years and years. But I just always like the mountains for whatever reason. Just a wonderful place there. You know, in my mind, it's just a. Uh, it's just God's country up paradise. there. It, it is. Yeah. It's a paradise up there. And some of the mountain folks up there are so good. Yeah. And uh, met a woman up there who does a um, hammered dulcimer and does the dulcimer workshop. And that was one of my favorite stories, too, is just the, just the culture of those dulcimers and up up in that area there. And there's a big argument, you know, where did that where did the dulcimer okay, come from? And in North that. Carolina, yeah. born and bred was it. Yeah. So a lot that of those was... people still live in the 60s and yes, 50s. Yes, they do. Which is they terrific. Do. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what about you, Mark? Where, where was your favorite well, place? <clears throat> that's kind of, I've been sitting here trying to figure that out. I, I'm like you. I liked everywhere, everywhere. I went. Mm -hmm. it, everywhere we ate lunch, everywhere we, I liked <laughs> yeah, every yeah, lunch. That's right. lunch. But um, probably the most fun I had, and it spanned a lot of places, right after uh, Channel 3 got their satellite truck, uh, we know it as the Conus truck, mm -hmm. uh, they really wanted to show off its capabilities that you could go live from anywhere. So we went from Murphy to Matteo mm -hmm. for like 12 days, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, we just went from one end of the state to the other, and uh, yeah. Did you have stories set up, or did you just find things? We, we set up a few, and we just stumbled onto some stuff, oh, yeah. and uh, it was just a lot of fun. You know, which reminds me of places, you know, on the way to places, uh, every once in a while, mm -hmm. once in a long while, we would stumble on something that we hadn't planned on and make a story out of That's it. That's what we did too. We found a little old house on Highway 321 going up between, what, Lenore and Boone. You come around a big curve, and here was this little house. It was a rainy day, and this vacant house was just sitting there on this little mountain curve, and there was an apple orchard out back, and, and John Steed and I were going by. I said, John, hold on a minute. Let's back up and stop and take a look at that house. And we walked inside, and it was like people hadn't been there for two or three years. And there was an old newspaper in the corner that, that was uh -huh. like six years old. And the, um, the rain was dripping off the roof. And John, John was a master, of course, at, at great photography. I said, why don't you just, we got a photography story here. Why don't you just shoot some scenes mm -hmm. of inside and out and through the windows and the apple orchard and this and that. And uh, I put together a little script wondering who might have lived here? And the little vapor in the corner, what clue did it give? And the apple orchard, and we, I shook a little apple tree and made an apple fall off for the camera. <laughs> Cheated a little bit there. <laughs> and we put together this little story, and I got a letter a week after the story ran from the daughter and the family who had lived in this house. Yeah, I recall that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh it was that... amazing. And let me tell you, for the next, I mean, you know, once in a while we go out and talk to Rotary Club and things about our experiences, whatever, people would come up all the time saying, Oh, I love that story about that old house on 321. We never went out that day looking well, for it. I mean, it we had happened. something similar happen to us, although it was a bizarre story. We were coming back from a story in Raleigh, and we came through Asheboro, and there was one of these little uh, shopping center carnivals set up. And I don't know why we decided to stop. It just looked <laughs> interesting to us. Well, there was, <clears throat> and in the back lot of this carnival, in a little booth, was this big woman. <laughs> who, <laughs> who, yeah, it's, it's a big woman who swallowed snakes, oh, oh. live oh. snakes. She would okay, tape their mouth shut, the and down the hatch they went. 
And that was one of the most unusual stories we ever did, but it got a lot of comment, but we just stumbled on it just because we decided, well, let's see what's happening at this little carnival over here. This was her living. She'd been a carnival person all of her life, and, uh... <laughs> now, we're going to attempt to swallow this snake. Oh, God. <laughs> With two poisonous snakes by her feet, Vicky puts a non-poisonous Florida rat snake down her throat. Oh, oh God. Oh, God. <laughs> Willard was a moonshiner and, uh, in Watauga County, of course. And uh, my first introduction to him was, of course, right there at his house. And he set up a still in the woods, his old still. They let him keep it. And they lit a fire, he lit a fire and uh, boiled water and mm -hmm. went through all of the the motions of moonshine and liquor again like he used to in the 30s with his black brim hat and his rifle in his hand or just in case the revenue showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how many of us did a story on Willard? I did the first one. I did a story, but I did a story with Willard after you and Charles Carrollt had done a story. That's and right. the gist of my story was, has success and fame spoiled <laughs> Willard Watson? <laughs> and it did. Not, not well, in, in a, in not a way, right. in, in a way. But he, uh, he, he enjoyed talking to you, and I remember the way he referred to old Charlie Kuralt. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, true, never a better story, never a more nearly perfect character. Yeah, it was. But he I believe Ken Udy did a story with him, too. Yeah, he did. And they were all yeah. different. Well, he was a legend. I even went to his funeral. He I died know. a couple of years ago at the age of 89. And Doc Watson, his first cousin, played uh, a couple of songs sitting on the front row uh, during his funeral service. And people just sort of stood up around the room and did little quick testimonials about Willard. I'll be doing it was something out of another era entirely. And then they buried him on the hill behind the church. And uh, I sort of felt like I had come to the end of an era when that happened. Well, sure. For the next couple of minutes, it's 1930, and you're a revenue agent combing the woods for moonshiners. And this is your lucky day because you have caught him red-handed. There's old Willard Watson firing up his 35-gallon furnace. He's already dumped in the four-day-old beer mash from the barrels. He's adding a gallon of rye and a gallon of malt from sprouted corn. It won't be long before he'll have a gallon of pure whiskey. The kind Willard declares will make you want to see your mother and shake her hand. Like any good moonshiner, Willard can feel the steam and know it's ready to cap. And just so that steam will force that pure stuff into the copper coils, he spreads pure rye paste around the edges of the cap. Now, you don't want to grab Willard till the liquor is ready to pour, and you've got to be careful of Rusty. It's known in these parts that Rusty will run anything from a bumblebee to a lizard, and he ain't partial to revenuers either. 65-year-old Willard Watson, though, is a prize catch for a government man. Moonshine got in his blood when he was just a small boy, and his uncle helped him make some pure apple brandy. But this mountaineer was smart. There's money in stilling liquor, he'd caution his kinfolk, but there's the penitentiary in it, too. Uh-oh, you know Willard can smell a revenue a hundred yards away, and he didn't bring that musket out for hunting squirrels. Maybe you'd better call the office and send for some help if you're going to bust up Willard Watson still today. In all his days as a moonshiner, they never got Willard behind bars. It's too late now because Willard has the government's permission to keep his old still. You've guessed, of course, that this is all a put on. Willard's been boiling water all this time, but it sure did bring back memories, like the time a friend put the government men on his trail. This fella turned us in and the law threw the 38th facial right in my face. He said, it won't be long now. And I turned, I wheeled and turned, and when I did, I just naturally dead flood out running. And while he'd put the light on me, I'd fall on the ground and skeet on my belly. And when he'd, the light had come off of me, I'd come to my feet. And I'm the only man there is in this county that absolutely outrun Polly White. Days that's gone by, we'd laugh about that. And he said, I must be partly littered because I outrun him skeeting on my belly. Willard and Ole Watson might be considered real-life Beverly Hillbillies without all the money. If you're a city slicker, you have never known them, and that is your misfortune. They are very much alive here in that other world where the only noise is a bird chirping, and the nearest thing to air pollution is the steam from a coffee pot. Today, John and I and our Boone correspondent George Flowers are dinner guests about to dish up mashed potatoes and gravy, snap beans, country ham, fried chicken, 
and homemade biscuits and honey. And we're about to hear Willard's reasoning that the rising generation will never know what good eating really is. And another thing, they don't know how to get out here and make a thing in the world in the garden. If you're to see one out in the garden, he's out on a pair of boots. And the only way to make a garden is is to throw the bare foot to it. Me and my wife last year went out here in the garden and we make a garden every year of about anything you want to eat in this rising generation. If you catch one in the garden and have a hat on his wide umbrella and little gloves to keep from getting his hands dirty. Now isn't it a shame that Willard has never learned to appreciate a good frozen TV dinner? Well, now it's entertainment time and Willard has agreed to pick and dance one of his favorites, Shout Little Lula. Willard's flat foot dance is legend down at the Darby Community Hall. story told how Willard still believes in moonshine liquor. He has a similar attitude about today's music. This new music he draws is just like this new whiskey. It just ain't much good. Well, before we leave this versatile mountain man, we might as well take a look at his hobby. Willard took up wood carving a few years ago, and now he complains he's in it too deep to get out. It's profitable, but it seems you never have enough of what people want, says Willard. I put one last question to Willard, and I should have been expecting the answer I got. How come you mountain people are so good at this kind of thing? Well, because we just had a short mind and no sense, I reckon. Now you're expert at all this. I have to give you a dose, Debbie. <laughs> if you found Willard Watson refreshing, it's understandable. If ever there was an honest, God-fearing, freedom-loving mountain man, it's Willard. Call him what you like, hillbilly, mountaineer, moonshiner, but it all comes out American, the vanishing variety. C.J. Underwood with the Carolina Camera on Wildcat Road in Deep Gap, North Carolina. You know, stories like Willard Watson were fun, and we had to work on all of them, but some required more work than others to even get the story lined oh, up. I tried a long time to get the story about Ava Gardner in Smithfield, my old hometown, and... Uh, it took a long time for me to persuade her two sisters to sit down and talk about Ava. Uh, I didn't think mm -hmm. I'd ever get that story, and I know you had an experience like yeah, that. Yeah, you mentioned that. It's ironic, too, that she was the one I did was uh, that took so much time was Frances Bobbier, the actress who played uh, Aunt B on the old Andy Griffith mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. It was three phone calls, a couple letters, two in-person visits before I finally said, uh, was told, I'll give you 15 minutes. And as the visit turned out to be about an hour, hour and a half, and it was a good story. I enjoyed talking to her, but she was not in person the way she was on Andy Griffith. Frances Bobbier was an actress for 50 years, 10 of them as television's Aunt B, that lovable lady who made life pleasant for all of Mayberry. But Aunt B did not make life pleasant for Frances Bobbier. For one thing, she and Andy Griffith Did didn't get along, rarely stage, speaking right? to one another. Secondly, Frances Bobbier, as an actress, got tired of cooking all that chicken and washing all those dishes. So when she came to Siler City, it was not to find Aunt B. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> I had had played Aunt B for 10 years, and it's very, very difficult for an actress or an actor to create a role and be so identified that you as a person no longer exist and all the recognition you get is for a part that's created on the screen. The people here in Siler City expect you to act and react the way Aunt B would. Yes, I think so, and I think they're disappointed if I destroy the image. Is Siler City that you live in now, anything at all like the Mayberry of the television scripts? Very, very much. Great deal of it. When you go shopping down the street, do the people you meet tell you that North Carolinians are, are not like they are portrayed on television? No. Absolutely, as far as they're concerned, Mayberry was absolutely authentic. It was almost as if they, their own family were being filmed, their own situations. They saw no difference, and I, I, uh, I give Andy Griffith credit for the whole 
um, not for the technical or for the structural uh, value of the show, but for all of the memory. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't so long ago he was here. He knows these people. And he would know whether an actor was right on the right track, and it would be no, no, no. And he knew when it was right, and that was invaluable. And uh, he'd remember situations. And it had a consistent kind of humor from beginning to end. Can you recall the script, the, the storyline, the one that may have been a favorite of the one that you did in 10 years? Was there a one particular favorite show? Yes, there was. It was my, my, my desire to uh, convince Andy that um, he should marry and that if I, did, if I married, I would give Andy an opportunity to not feel responsible about me or leaving me. And my involvement with a man who was a cleaning man in the town and the misery I suffered, but anything not to put Andy in this position to free him from his obligation. Some of your friends in Mayberry were always trying to get a little romance involved in Aunt B's life. Have you had any of the same things here in Silo City? No, <laughs> no they, haven't, they haven't confused me to that extent. They see a 70-year-old lady and think, think she probably wants to be alone. And uh, they're, they're having a problem of trying to be friendly and show their friendliness and at the same time not intrude. And it makes it very difficult for them. And a uh, great many of them just, uh, I've had many, many Christmas cards and gifts. And uh, it, it was a little difficult adjustment for me when I first came. I, I have a great deal to learn from Silo City and from North Carolina. It's an entirely different new way of life. And at 70, I think if you still keep trying to change and adjust, your mind stays a little more alert, so if I can match up with any of the 85-year-olds and 90-year-olds I've met, be fortunate, They're smart, clear-headed. Yes, I can be. That's about I'm the way honest. Aunt B you know, would have put it. <clears throat> this is Bill Ballard with the Carolina Camera in Siler City. Well, I guess my favorite character, the one that got the most comments, uh, was a fellow that we called the Bean Shooter Man. Uh -huh. um, he uh, was a chicken farmer who lived out in the middle of nowhere near Asheboro. In fact, we had to, we had a hard time getting in touch with him. Uh, we had a friend of a friend of a neighbor down the street go deliver a message that this TV crew from Charlotte wanted to come see him. and. Um, he was just an amazing guy because he could do, I mean, he could hit literally anything with his, uh, with his slingshot. In fact, when we pulled up in his yard and first got out of the van, the first thing he did was pull his bean shooter out of his pocket and he blew a bumblebee right out of the air. Oh! No. Yeah, just, and he said, you see that, boys? And he ended up on Johnny Carson as a result you know. of our story, and he had a big time out there, but I think that's uh, my favorite of all time and certainly one uh, worth revisiting. He's not easy to find. Cross a one-lane bridge on a dirt road south of Ashborough that leads you past acres of tall corn, and there you'll find Rufus Hussey. Are you the fellow with the slingshot? The, the feller. <laughs> I'm the one. The one. The one. <laughs> I'm the bean shooter man. The bean shooter. Rufus Hussey is known far and wide as None the better. bean shooter man. Him. Translated, that simply means he is awesome with a slingshot. At a particular place, you want me to hit the last one? Hit it right on the Pepsi. How about that? Let's hit the blue. The blue, all right. <laughs> no, I'm not a show-off. I'll just give you the facts, and if that ain't sufficient, we'll go to something else. <laughs> Well, the facts are that Rufus Hussey's been deadly accurate with a bean shooter since he was 10 years old. But it was no childhood game then. It was a matter of survival. A lot of times when you uh, had that, you ended up something to eat where you didn't have it if you didn't have it along with you. Rufus was part of a poor farm family of 13. He used the slingshot because only his oldest brother was allowed to use the shotgun to hunt rabbit. Well, the rabbit is the easiest thing there to kill. See the, see the stick there? That way it hit him in the head and you wouldn't, wouldn't you, bother his body. You just nicked it, didn't you? That's right, hit him in the head, but now I'll show you how to hit the whole rabbit. A whole rabbit uh -huh. or a whole walnut? Rufus can get either one. You got him. 
At the age of 65, Rufus's eyesight is also good enough to use these rocks to pick off a quarter in midair. There it goes. Yeah, you hit it. Is the evidence there? The evidence is here. You that's got a, it. That's souvenir. Uh, the evidence is a chip just left of the L in Liberty. Rufus says he can't really explain how he does it, especially since he doesn't aim the slingshot. You want to see your target, first thing. Right. It don't make no difference where you have this hand, but the one up front what controls it. The one up front controls it. Right. See the jig? Yes, sir. Rufus makes all his own slingshots, mostly using dogwood. I tell him this is my office work right here. Rufus finds wood in the natural shape of a slingshot. He doesn't carve them. Then a few twists of the wrist, and he's got a new bean shooter. This one is number 4,156. He started selling them back when rubber became more widely available after World War II. So after I found out you get this gum rubber, I decided I'd revive the art in 52. So I started making them and demonstrating and showing people what they'd do. And what Rufus can do with a slingshot is astounding. He often cuts weeds from his cornfield. So you want to go to the right? Yeah, fall to the right. <laughs> okay. It did. And the sound of Rufus Hussey's footsteps means sure death for insects. See the Japanese beetle on the leaf? Yes, sir. Watch me get him. He didn't oh. hurt the leaf. <laughs> Watch him do it again. Right. Oh. Rufus Hussey doesn't have a TV or a telephone. He just likes country quiet with his slingshot. His mailbox advertises his skill, but modestly, he won't come right out and say he's the best. Well, I've not been challenged lately. I don't know where you, what you would call it. We'll let you decide that. What was really funny about uh, the Bean Shooter Man is that he ended up being, uh, I mentioned earlier, on Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. And we did a follow-up story on him about how he liked going out there, and his response was classic. He said, I ain't never seen a place that had more stuff that nobody needed in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> so he was not impressed with Los Angeles at all. Uh, we had talked earlier about pet stories, uh, and they are kind of hard to do animal stories, but we did have one that I think turned out to be kind of a classic, and that was uh, our friend down in South Carolina who had a dog. He swore to me on the telephone that, that this dog could climb trees. And I was very reluctant, but I decided to give it a shot, and uh, oh wow, the, the story of Flatnose uh, is just amazing. Meet Flatnose, a dog who has no trouble catching a cat. Cat's up. Now, you better go get him. Go get him, Flatnose. Go get him. Flatnose is a 65-pound bulldog with a climbing gear. He has no trouble hanging onto a pine tree with his claws, uh, but he generally has to be helped down. Come here, Flatnose. You see that cat? Oh, yeah, that baby can go, can you? Yeah. Barney Odom has become a bit of a celebrity around Darlington. People come to Barney's house from nearby towns just to see his dog climb trees. And it's hard to keep Flat Nose out of the trees. Flat Nose. Here, Flat Nose. Come here. No, not that. How long will he stay up there, Barney? He'll stay up there a pretty good while. See? Come here. How did this happen? I mean, did he just... Just something he started doing. I used to walk him. When I wrecked, four days a year old. Yeah? Me and my wife walk around the edge of them woods right now. And I could tell, tell him I'd sick the dog to the woods. He'd always look up in the trees. I started to whip him at him. And one day he went up the tree. And of course, when you've got a dog that can do that, you're bound to end up on a dog food commercial. If you've got an extra special dog, you feed him extra special dog food. And here in tiny Dovesville, South Carolina, Flat Nose is even more exciting than the town's new stop sign. You know, we got a new stop sign up here, but the dogs are a whole lot better than that. <laughs> dogs are better than a new stop sign? Yeah. We used to have to go on Sunday to sit around and look at our new stop sign. But now we're looking Flat Nose a little bit. Ah, oh, she's strange. Uh, that's George Beasley. He and other residents of Dovesville just yeah. love to play with Barney Odom's dogs. And Barney loves it when a TV or newspaper photographer comes around to visit Flat Nose. Look at the camera, boy. See the camera? Yeah, Flat Nose. <laughs> Look at the camera. Right, y'all. Yeah, you, you sound Sit. like... 
You sound like a proud parent getting your child to pose at Kmart. Yeah. They got so much sense, they make you love them. Make you love them. Make you love them. They sure do. So Dubsville may not have a lot of the extras that big cities offer, but then again, how many city folks can spend a relaxing Sunday afternoon under the pine trees watching a bulldog climb? Go, go, go get him. Go get that cat. Go get him, boy. He's up there. Get him now. You suck, boy. You know that, boy. You suck, mate. You know, right now, we have a whole bunch of fellas over here from Old Carolina Camera Segments, and I just noticed something. There was never a woman on Carolina Camera as a host. Well, I mean, these guys did a terrific job, but I mean, I just noticed that. So, if there's a Carolina camera, we know what's going to happen next time, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really been terrific seeing my old co-workers from WBTV days, and they've shared some tremendous stories about some tremendous people of the Carolinas. And I know between all of these fellas who live and work right here, you all have some wonderful friends in, in your neighborhoods, from your churches, from your organizations at home looking. And so, what do you say to them right now? How can they be a part of this community? Yeah. Call yeah. in. Call and in. what's the number, guys? 371-8787. Well, you, you did a lot of stories, I know, that went to Johnny Carson. Uh, not only yeah. Flat Nose went out there, uh, the the bean shooter man, yep. the manure man. Oh, that's right. I, I went out about him. And that's I did a right. story on him, too. But you know, one story that I did, she was already famous, but she had lost her fame, I guess you could say, when we did her. Her name was Eva Boyd. And we got a call, and somebody said, you got to go see her. She works down at a, what was called a soul food place down uh, to, in eastern North Carolina. So we went down there, and sure enough, in this uh, sort of uh, wasn't, the fanciest place it was is a soul food restaurant, so to speak, and it was just a place where folks would come in and, and eat, and they had good collard greens mm. and black eyed peas and uh -huh. such as that, and I met her, just the nicest girl that ever was. And so we did the story on her, and the thing was, most people didn't know her by the name of Eva Boyd, they knew her by, better by the name of Little Eva, Ooh. the woman who sang the song, The Locomotion, back oh. in the early 60s, really big hit. She tur toured all over the United States. You know, she used to be Carol King's uh, babysitter. That's how she came upon the song. Went into a studio, recorded it. Big time fame, and then she just sort of gradually, like a lot of early 60s singers, I guess, yeah. uh, fell out of the limelight. But then after we did that, she said she really didn't want to do it anymore. Every day it seems like I'm seeing she's in some big rock and roll show somewhere. <laughs> right. But back when we did that story, she was just Eva Boyd at, at a soul food restaurant. The year was 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis shook the world. John Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth. And on the music charts, Bobby Darin ranked number three with things. Neil Sadaka's Breaking Up Is Hard To Do was at number two. Breaking Up Is Hard To Do. And the number one song in the nation, well, that brings us back to 1987 and Hainsey's Grill in Kinston, where Eva Boyd works as a waitress. Thank you. You may not recognize her face, the name may not sound familiar, but at one time in her life, just about everybody was singing along with Eva Boyd, which takes us back to 1962 and the number one song in the nation. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. I did that song. It was me. I did it. I, I like to hear it. You know, I don't, I don't want to do it, but I did do that. And when she did, she was better known as Little Eva. Born in North Carolina, she moved to New York as a teenager and worked as a backup singer. She also was a babysitter for songwriter Carol King. And when King and Jerry Goffin co-wrote The Locomotion, they asked Eva to sing it on the demo record. They did that. They did just a rough record. Took it in, he listened to it and said, hey, well, hey, let's try it. And they put it on there. And it took off just like that. 
the song went gold. And at 16 years old, Eva was literally an overnight success. She toured the United States and Europe with other stars such as Sam Cooke, James Brown, and Jackie Wilson. I was on cloud nine. <laughs> You know, naturally, it was amazing to me, and it was something that I always dreamed of because, as I tell everybody when they interview me, I, I wanted, you know, when, when you have to write the essay of what you want to be when you grow up, you know, everybody had to do that in school. And I said I wanted to be a nurse or a singer. But the best Eva could do after locomotion was number 12 on the charts with Keep Your Hands Off My Baby. And by 1970, Eva's star had faded. She left the business and moved back to North Carolina with very little to show for what she'd done. You know, I felt like I really had been used because I really loved these people and I trusted them. And I just knew that one day when I needed funds, they would be there. I just, I just felt, you know, didn't even doubt it, didn't worry about it or anything. And then when I decided that I wanted to do something with my share of the money, there wasn't any. But Eva isn't bitter about how things turned out. She's very happy with her life today. She became a Christian in 1972. She's been working at Hainsey's the last two years. And she's been swamped with fan letters after her picture recently appeared in a Where Are They Now feature in People magazine. It's an honor to be writing you in the hope that you will receive my letter. As you can guess, I am a tremendous fan of yours, like millions of others are also. Eva doesn't sing the locomotion any longer. She says that part of her life is behind her. I've learned to be a for real person. And for real, I'm not little Eva 16 years old no more. I'm 43. I'm a 43-year-old woman who knows that that ain't real. And, and I would think that Christ would be very unhappy with me if I went back to something that he spared me from. You know, I hear that song, Locomotion, on the radio all the time all now. The time. I wonder and, if she and, still gets royalties from uh, that. Oh, I don't think she gets royalties from that, but she does appear in a lot of those old-time rock and roll shows mm -hmm. that go around there. I'm glad to see she's doing well again. She really is. She does that. But, you know, as extraordinary a career as she had had, and she, she was very big back in her day, I think one of my favorite stories was about a man that no one would have ever heard of. He worked at a church, and he was as simple a man as there was, but he was extraordinary in his simplicity. This is the new $2.5 million edition being built at the First Presbyterian Church in Concord. And this is the man it's being named for, 85-year-old Will Young. What was your reaction when you first learned they were going to name this after you? Well, uh... I don't know, for a long time, I just couldn't kind of get over this shock. It was just shock. I, she said, it's hard for me to believe. <laughs> <I'll> be. <laughs> it's, yeah. Buildings like this are often named for those who contribute great sums of money or long-standing church members. But Will Young is neither. He has, though, for the last 60 years, been the custodian at First Presbyterian. Why have you stayed here so long? Nah, that is the question. Sometimes I ask my own self that question. <laughs> Will was 25 when he started work here in 1927. He was paid $15 a week at the time. Over the years, there were other job offers, but Will says he's always felt a close bond with the members here and that his work is as much a ministry as it is a job. It seemed like to me, the longer I stayed, the more I liked and enjoyed people, being around the people. I don't know why. And many times I asked myself that question, why I stay so long. But now after I began to get up in age, I said, well, there ain't no need to try to make no change now because I done come over the hump now, so. Uh, Mrs. Alley got those flowers from back in the vestibule and put them on the table here for... Uh, Jim Holderness is minister at First Presbyterian. He is excited about naming the new building for a man he says embodies the Christian ethic. It's a chance for us to put in stone what I think is basic theology, and that is that greatness is defined not by the way that uh, we normally define it, but by the way in which one serves their fellow human beings. And so Will represents that and uh, better than anybody I know.
what are your plans for the future? Are you ever going to stop? What I say by that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I do want to go on as long as I can. <laughs> Work as long as I can. It's like those people say, uh, uh, just retire and says, I'm going to let God retire me. <laughs> You know, one of the, the, the elements of this assignment we haven't really talked about a great deal was the outstanding photographers oh, that we were able to really, work with. And it was really. really so often a photographer's story. Well, they, That's the reason they called it Carolina <laughs> Camera. Camera. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't Carolina Reporter or a Script or whatever. No, we worked with some really fantastic one, uh, photographers. George Williams was the first photographer that I worked with. Yeah, I worked and with George right. was wonderful mm -hmm. to, to work with, always patient and he was a little bit older than I was, and I was kind of green when I first came into it, and then worked with Kevin Ryan, and uh, Kevin, uh, a master at it, and, and of course, Joe Travis was uh, one of the photographers, and, and Joe, I think the thing about it was Joe and Kevin and George, they all cared about the stories, too. Mm -hmm. They cared about what we were doing, and they wanted it to look good, and it was a chance for them to shine, and it really was mm -hmm. a, a wonderful... Uh, and they were lucky guys because the photographers would stand in line to get to this yes, job. Yes, and would. my favorite story about George was we uh, did a story on a coaster fanatic at Carowinds. And so we were interviewing this guy on Thunder Road. And uh, that meant George had to ride Thunder Road with a camera on his shoulder backwards, mm -hmm. getting us talking while we were riding. Well, to get all the takes that we wanted, we had to ride Thunder Road about 12 times straight. <laughs> oh, no. And it was only after everything was done and packed away that George said, by the way, I hate roller coasters. I just wanted you to know that. But he didn't tell me ahead of time, and he just did the story. Yeah. That's right, it was a sacrifice. Well, of course, well, I, can't, yeah. I can't let this time go by without mentioning Dave Clanton, who I worked with for the first year. You worked with him for a year. Sure did. Dave was an excellent photographer, slow as molasses. <laughs> uh, deliberate. Uh, yes, very <laughs> deliberate. But you know, he's now as a freelancer working on Hollywood feature films. So yeah, he, I'll be doggone. Yeah. Oh, a great photographer. And um, of course, the original Carolina camera photographer, John Steed. Mm -hmm. we, the did master. The, we did the first 14 months. I told him every frame was a Rembrandt. <laughs> there was no I never saw a piece oh, of film that wasn't yeah. perfectly lit, perfect focus. Uh, he, he was he was a master and still but he always us, says yeah. we need one more shot. Yeah, one more <laughs> shot. And you work That's with exactly uh, right. Charlie Hemrick. Charlie Hemrick, uh, who's now his family's a singing group out of Winston Salem up in that area. Charlie's wow. still a great guy. That's Charlie was as quick as there ever was. We would arrive at a place as opposed to Dave. When we got there, Dave had all of his stuff spread out on a black blanket <laughs> over the hood, every piece by piece, ready to get things together to shoot. Charlie, we'd arrive. And I'd go say hello to whoever it was, and right behind me in two minutes was Charlie with the camera on his shoulder saying, what do you want me to shoot? <laughs> he was ready at all times. The you know. best compliment I ever heard of Charlie Hemrick, another one of our colleagues said, if you had one shot to shoot the story of your life, take Charlie Hemrick with you. He'd mm -hmm. get it. He'd get it. He'd he get sure it. would. And never used a tripod. He could hold that thing just frozen still on the shoulder. Well, you know, Bill was talking earlier about how uh, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Carolina Camera gave uh, Channel 3 a rating shot. And it's amazing. I, for a short time, I did the 11 o'clock news. But, anchoring. Uh, anchoring, that's right. But after I started doing the Carolina Camera, that's when people began to really recognize, oh, that's who you are. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we were going to a story one day in Hickory, and uh, George and I stopped in at uh, the waffle shop up there in Hickory place was packed and we went in and this and the guy from one end of the counter goes hey you're the guy that does Carolina camera and I said yeah that's right and he goes and you're fat <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh -huh. uh, most of the people we met were honest that's right yeah, they were they were but that brutally but it's it's the best assignment I oh. ever had it was just yeah. so much no fun question. don't you think oh yes yeah. yes we could all say that I'm sure and I've been at BTV now more than 30 years wow. along with CJ mm -hmm. and I when people say what did you enjoy most Everything else is tied for second. That's Carolina right. Camera's first. <laughs> sure you got is. it right. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and you know, I think that's what made Carolina Camera was special. Still is special as far as I'm concerned. And the thing about it was, it was always positive. Mm 
You know, a lot of people turn on the news, and, and granted, a lot of it is negative. It's important information right. that people need to know. I think it, it helps them live in their world better in giving those things. But it was always positive, and I think people always knew that when they saw Carolina Camera, it was going to give them somewhat of a boost, too. And not only for the viewers, but the people, too, you know, I would say Carolina Camera was the only venue where people wanted to see that camera coming mm -hmm. and were glad to see it and welcomed it. They weren't and it, distrustful. It, they weren't distrustful at all, and they knew that we were there to do a story about what they were and what was going on, and it was, it was a very positive thing. <laughs> in fact, we, we arrived once in Murphy, a little town in the mountains, and uh, Deputy Sheriff came up to us and said, you all here to do the vote-buying scandal? And he was clearly <laughs> nervous about yeah. that, and I said, no, we're here to do a feature story for the Carolina Camry. He goes, well, welcome to town. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and right. that's what we yeah. got all the time, too. We would yeah. drive up, and we had Carolina Camry on the side of that van, and people would wave at us and say, what are you all doing? And everybody was curious. Yeah. They would always love to know. And we'd stop, meet somewhere, and folks would come up to us. It, was, <laughs> it just generated so much positive feelings about our station, of course, and about what we were doing. Yeah. And, it, and it just it made me feel good being able to do it. I think it was an idea whose time came just at the right moment. Yeah, yes. The decade of the 70s, even into the 80s, were a lot slower and more comfortable and laid back than things are today. You know, our newscasts are entirely different. It's boom, 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 and move along, move along. Right. That's the era we're in. So I suspect we've probably seen the last of it as, as we knew it, and there are here and there, there are elements of it on television. Even Harry on CBS yeah. once in a while has, yeah, a, has a good little story. But, but it was, uh, we are very fortunate that we came along at the time we did to be able to do something that enjoyable. And the, the thing I remember, of course, as much as anything, was, was getting to meet the real people mm -hmm. who were out there in our viewing area and getting an understanding of who it is we're talking to every day and every evening. And uh, they may be quite different than what the statistics and the research necessarily shows. Mm -hmm. But the Carolinas are full of uh, the best people who ever walked the oh, earth, absolutely. as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And we were able to show that over two full decades. Mm -hmm. And um, I will always, just like you said, consider that I was probably one of the luckiest guys to ever come along in this business when I did to be able to do something that yeah. meant that much to our viewers. And uh, meant that much to the station, and uh, just gave us fun. something to hang our hat on mm -hmm. yeah. for so long. Who knows? Maybe one day again, something like that will come about I again. Got one more good story left in me. I know. I know. <laughs> I do too. A couple of them, maybe. So maybe one of these days. Let's hope. <laughs> Blues is a happy sound to me because it's based on mostly on people that maybe is on chain gang, I will say, or something like that. It's mostly based on such as that. And then you look back, how happy you are that you haven't lived this kind of life. What made me strive so hard in this type of music, it was something my daddy had given to me. And I can get to thinking about the sounds that he made on the guitar, and, and I try real hard up until today to do some of the music that I heard him do. And I just love it more and more every day, I guess. You know, all, like, all night long, we've been enjoying reliving the wonderful days of Carolina Camera at this Carolina Camera reunion. And right now, three gentlemen 
who know all about a lot of special people who've lived and worked in the Carolinas. CJ, Mark, John Carter. It's just so wonderful to reunite, reunite myself with you guys. Yes. Yes. Yeah, long, I know, we Carolina. really have it. And the funny thing is, before we were getting ready to go on the air, CJ said, so, um, what you gonna ask me? You, you know, you know how this is gonna go. And I said, no. no. You know, and it's kind of neat because CJ and I worked together for a number of years, but it is so different for him to be in the role of being interviewed. So I'm really getting a kick so out of this. So ask him something hard. Yeah, ask yeah, him something hard. Okay. All right. Uh, let me see. What? Tell me. Nice. I'll ask, ask you. Um, I, this is hard for CJ. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite eating spot oh, in gosh. the Carolinas? Because oh, we oh. all knew whenever CJ did a story, he would find mm -hmm. some great place to eat. I would often Usually for them. free. Uh-huh. No, no, no. Oh, okay, all right. But, uh, you know, anytime you got outside Mecklenburg County, and, you know, you were on the expense account. Right. So I made sure we left real early, so breakfast would be included. <laughs> Lunch and, uh, and dinner. Uh, you know, we did go up. I, I know all the roads, all the numbers, and all the, and all the uh, gravel roads as well, mm -hmm. without numbers, uh, over most of the 75-mile radius of this region, and I definitely knew where all the good restaurants were. Oh, boy. Uh, Indies in Albemarle. That's a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. Golly, today I go up and down those roads, and they're not there anymore. What, do you, what does that say? Or some of those favorite little um, spots. <laughs> those, um, you know, Brown's grocery store, or whatever. Oh, yeah. You know, what about the names of towns? Do any strange names come to town? To come to mind? Mm. We, did, we did a story in Why Not. Uh, oh, which yeah. is in Moore County. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Mark, didn't you write a book at one point? About we did. We compiled uh, quite a few stories into a paperback book and uh, back in, gosh, I think that was like 86 or 87. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. sure did. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I would have done that, but Andrew Shore threw away all my scripts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saved all of mine. When he you, took it over, yeah. Uh, and you know, John, I'm not sure a lot of people uh, realize that at one point you were a politician and probably all those years mm -hmm. on uh, mm -hmm. television and hosting Carolina Camera did. Hurt. I, I, that probably didn't hurt when yeah. I was uh, campaigning for the Senate, uh, yeah. the North Carolina Senate. But I, I had been away from the station for a little while. Uh -huh. But yes, there were some folks who would recognize that. So, uh, but the image of Carolina Camera was a, a, such a good one, not just for me, but for CJ and Mark and Bill Ballard and the other folks who did it. It was such a. We talked about it earlier in the show. Just such a positive feature, yeah. and I think people really enjoyed seeing us. I think what we did is we celebrated the people of the Carolinas. Absolutely. Yeah. And Exactly. so unique and yeah. wonderful and it was positive and yes. I think a, a lot of times these days you see a lot of feature stories and all but I think a lot of these stories point out more the oddity of people mm -hmm. or the reporter becomes the story and and Carolina camera focused on the subject of the story and it, and it wasn't celebrating oddity but it was celebrating uniqueness yes. and the spirit mm -hmm. of the yes. people of the Carolinas yeah. it, it was such a wonderful thing yeah. to do and, and he still who, sounds like a politician <laughs> he does, he does. <laughs> and, and the people were so genuine and matter-of-fact Oh, about were. whatever it was that they did, yeah. and you know? You, uh, you, you could not do this kind of feature through those years, and even today especially, anywhere but the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a unique part of the world uh, where people are using their talents for such unusual things. Um, and that was what I loved to do. I loved to sit down with somebody who could use their hands and yeah. make something come alive. Yeah. Artists carving wooden ducks, whatever. It, I just love to see people like that and figure out what makes them tick. Now, even um, some from the years when you were doing Carolina Camera, even up to now, I'm sure a lot of people still come up to you and talk about their mm -hmm. favorite stories. But what were some of the favorite stories of some of your favorite viewers over the years? Mm -hmm. oh. I guess I got more. We showed earlier the, the story on Rufus Hussey, the bean shooter man. And uh -huh. I, I think by far and away I got more comments on that story than any other one that I ever did. Although Flat Nose, the tree climbing dog, got a lot of comments. Yeah. Absolutely. Whenever yeah. we did a story about a place to eat. Oh, yeah. I would always get a lot of reaction. Nell's place in Cleveland County, <laughs> this woman had set up a little I don't even know if I want to call it a restaurant, a little kitchen in, in this auction house where they auctioned off livestock and such as that. So when you went to the place, when you first walked into the area, you got a good whiff of the oh, livestock around before there. Before you went to but, the eating yeah, facility. Okay. Before you went into the eating facility. But she had set this up mainly for the folks who'd come to the auction mm -hmm. just to give them a sandwich or something. And it just sort of spiraled from that and grew bigger and bigger and it was out in the middle of sort of nowhere out there and we did this story and this woman and uh, there were two women there everything was made from scratch they'd pile it on your plate and only cost like a couple of bucks for this that if you went into a regular restaurant it probably cost you 10 or 15 dollars i think i probably got more i got a call i got a letter just 
two weeks ago mm-hmm. asking me where that place was. Oh, my goodness. So people still remember that, and it's been seven, eight years since we had that story on the air. So people remember that. The Carolina camera stories just seem to live in people's minds. And you know what needs to happen now? We kind of need to do an update on a lot of those old folks that were oh, on yeah, the yeah. camera. See how they're doing. You know, because for instance, really flat nose the dog is dead <laughs> He now. died, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. and yep. you know, I mean, that got a lot of attention when that story about him dying aired right. on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. it sure did. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you, you know, this is a very special part of television, being able to bring real stories to people about um, about everyday life. Yeah, oh, and right. it really you is. Know? Exactly. And, and you know, I, I think a hundred years from now, if, if there were no newspapers or whatever around or history books, I think if you could take our Carolina camera stories, you would really get a really good picture of what life was like in the Carolinas. Real people, the yes. everyday, ordinary people yeah. of North and South Carolina, and the uniqueness of those people, as CJ yeah. was talking about, is a really good slice of ordinary life ordinary people doing sometimes some extraordinary things, exactly. but good everyday people. And and we showed you the pictures, mm-hmm. you heard them, you saw them, you could almost reach out there and touch them. It, and, it, it just uh, and we really got to do something that uh, people in television news on the local level, day to day, don't get to do too much of, mm-hmm. and that is right. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. Tell a story. Oh, the, the, the most fun thing at all was to, was to get all that video, all that information, mm-hmm. all those interviews, come back, sit down, go through it all, <clears throat> and then try to sit down and compose something that would tell the story mm-hmm. in the right way. I used to sit in front of, a, at those days, a typewriter, of all things. Yeah, right, before and, computers. And yeah. sit literally for 15 minutes before that first line would come through the mind. Mm. And, ah, there it is. And then it would start rolling. And that was so inspiring, so much fun to, to be able to use the English language. Uh-huh. We're, because it's such a beautiful language, after all. It is. We're going to take a, a, a look at another snippet of a story that Mark actually did on Jethro Man. Oh, so the uh, man let's uh, take a look yeah. at that one right now. You can tell when school's out in Belmont because the street around Jethro Man's house is full of bicycles. So is his driveway. Tracy, what kind of bike you got? Kids check out bicycles here as if they were library books. Anybody else? What color bike you got here? Meet Jethro Mann, working quietly in all this confusion. He is the Bicycle Man of Belmont. Jethro Mann believes we throw away a lot of things in this country we could put to good use, such as bicycles. So here in Belmont, garbage men don't haul these old bikes to the dump anymore. They just bring them here to Jethro Mann. Jethro works day and night fixing up the old bikes. That way, kids who don't have a bicycle can borrow one. Most of all, it's teaching them how to be responsible. Teach them how to ask for things and how to be grateful for things. And kids like Derek Faust are grateful. Would you have a bike to ride if it weren't for him? No. Neither would most of these youngsters. Well, he's, he's real nice for letting us ride them bikes when when we don't have anything else to ride and anything else to do. Jethro Mann not only provides bikes, but occasional trips to McDonald's for everybody, and something more, instruction on saying please and thank you. He told me that um, when I come to ask a bike to say please instead of just ask, and he told us to speak to everyone. Without thank you, they don't get a bike. Can I uh, leave my bike here and check, uh, t- check out Team Speed to Ride? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. It seemed to be a hard thing for them to say please and thank you. And I've tried to explain to them that they may not ever have a lot of money, but if they have courtesy and they know how to go about it, they can get almost anything that they want. It costs Jethro about $500 a year to keep chains and other parts for the bikes, but he says, the Lord has repaid me with my life. You see, Jethro's been struggling with a usually deadly form of arthritis and he finds working with his hands actually helps. He also finds it rewarding just to teach the kids. I'd like to, for them to remember me that I tried to teach them that honesty is the best policy and that there's a dignity in labor. A mule that's in the harness can't do much kicking. A person who's working can't do much backing up. They have to go forward. 
You know, folks have really paid attention to what we've yes. been doing here in the Carolinas. In fact, so many of the stories that wound up on the networks were first aired on Carolina Camera, like yeah. the one that you just mm -hmm. saw on The Bicycle Man. Yeah, Corral, yeah. After we told uh, Corralt about that one. He did that one and a lot of stories that we told him mm. about because he loved to come back home to the Carolinas, and <laughs> yeah, it gave definitely. him a good excuse to, to come back home. Yeah. And I know Mark and I used to... Uh, our, we had contact with The Tonight Show on a regular yeah. basis. Johnny Carson's producer... Oh. Uh, regularly called us the, looking the, for the stories. fellow with the jewelry, with the, yes, uh, the manure man. Yes, manure yes, man. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. we did. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. yeah, that was a favorite segment. Uh, everyone got a kick out of that, yeah, singing really here was. locally and nationally. What mm -hmm. what final uh, word, you know, to just kind of wrap up the experience of having had the privilege to meet a lot of people in the Carolinas? Mm. Well. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll try that uh, since I sort of was there, there at the beginning. September 7th of 1970. Oh, I'll never boy. forget it. Doesn't that seem a long time ago? Um, it, uh, it, it has always been uh, a privilege to, and, and to look back on what we did. And, to, and to, I, of course, feel like I've been extraordinarily lucky to have lived through the golden age of television news, especially when we did a lot of things and time wasn't such so compact as right. it is now. And we got a little extra s stuff to do. But uh, the, uh, the, the people and uh, being able to be a part of their lives and mm -hmm. make them the stars for just three and a half minutes, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, mm. uh, it's, uh, it feels real good to have been a part of something like that. Well, yes. we're asking you to be a star right now, and mm -hmm. we're asking you if you've enjoyed the segments that these gentlemen have brought to the Carolinas for about 27 years. It's your chance to be a star and to be a witness to what's so wonderful about the Carolinas. Take part in community television. It's really very, very simple. The number is there on your screen, 371-8787. Now is truly the time to call and to take part in it. We can't provide wonderful television. We can't reminisce about all the things that you've seen tonight without your help. And it's important that we all help make this continue to happen. So if you've enjoyed all the wonderful segments tonight, you've really got to be a part of it. You know, the last couple of days I heard a lot of people say, Carolyn, I enjoyed watching you on television. Well, if you did, if you've enjoyed watching these segments tonight, then prove it by calling in. Our phones have not been ringing enough, and I know these fellas would certainly appreciate it. It would be a show of appreciation of the hard work and all the wonderful stories that they brought to you all over the years. I've certainly enjoyed reminiscing and, and being a part of this whole effort. And, and, you know, I think one of the neat things, too, is to have the opportunity to see the fellas behind the cameras. And, you know, and, and they really made Carolina Camera what it was. We don't give Kevin and Joe and George and Brad and Terry and the other photographers enough credit. That's true. Some of those stories wouldn't have been anything near what they were were it not That's for right. their abilities. And mm. they, you know, we put them through a lot. I know Kevin <laughs> and Joe and George working with them, sometimes that edit deadline would come there, and I was going, oh, do I need to really get that ready? We're only going on in five minutes or a, something like that. Know, so one of the they other, put up with a lot. One of the other things, uh, I think it was George and Kevin, too, was, was saying that it was just really interesting working with different Carolina camera hosts because you all had your own unique personality. You wore your <laughs> Your own special blend to each Carolina camera segment that you did. But you know, we were all sitting around in the lounge talking a few minutes ago about what a terrific opportunity this has been on WTVI this mm -hmm, week. And, and in fact, I'm looking forward to the Friday, I think it's Friday when this they're Friday going to do radio. 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 Yes, yes. yes. So, and you know, you just don't see television no, like this. You really don't. Except in, on stations like this, and that's why it is worth picking up the phone and calling to keep this going. This Absolutely. has just been terrific. Probably well, the, the whole Telerama effort is really just beginning. This is the first week of it. We're talking six weeks it's of great. quality programming and really telling unique and wonderful stories oh, about yeah. the Carolinas. I think it's kind of nice when people who are new to the area have a chance to move here and learn mm -hmm. in six weeks' time about all the great qualities of this area. I mean, they hear about the great banking industry, like the fo wonderful folks at First Union, and we know, we know we have great volunteers, people who are really committed, but we want you to get involved now, too. We want you to call in and support your community television station. That's right. And, you know, some people may be wondering, you know, John and CJ being the high-paid guys that they are, <laughs> they're even volunteering to be here tonight. Yeah. So right. pick up that television. Really? Yeah, really? Yeah. We'll talk about that high There's no check here tonight. tonight. You know, <laughs> no, Could I say a quick word for Joe Travis, who really is responsible for putting all of these things together? What incredible, hundreds of hours he's worked on this, and also a big word on behalf of WTVI. I've been here 30 years, 
and this station does so many things mm -hmm. that nobody else can do mm -hmm. and it's got to keep rolling yeah, absolutely that's true. Uh, it's, it's the latitude and programming you have to, to be able to do the things you do here that commercial television can't it's mm -hmm. a vital part of this community and i just personally like to ask some of you folks that have been watching me all these years to Make a little contribution on my Please, behalf, would you? Please, folks. It's very, very important. It really does. You know, I think when uh, those folks who've been watching you for so long, CJ, have really become a part of your family. They feel oh, like yeah. you're their friend, and, and we all know that you are. They've supported you during the, the great times. Um, and and if you are part of a family, you support that That's family. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, just seeing all the fellas here tonight, and it really is wonderful to reminisce with all of my friends from many years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. For 20 years now that I've been here in Charlotte oh, wow. and uh, so you know I have friends here with me and I know I have friends watching at home and we want you all to support quality programming it's just that simple yep. I, I don't know if you understand those of us who've been in the business for at least 20 years I think all of us Maybe, Kevin, you, you're the young tyke in the group? It's close. And I'm knocking on 20. Okay. All right. All right. But, you know, we've been around in the business for 20 years, and we know it just doesn't come any better than this, to be able to offer what you have seen here tonight. Mm -hmm. Truly well, quality program. A lot of locally produced stuff and a lot of uh, substance in, in that, too. The, the avenue here that TVI offers people a, a little bit longer look. I know mm -hmm. uh, before and I was involved in a couple of programs we produce here, Police Beat Live, yes. which gives folks an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with the police chief, Dennis Nowicki, mm -hmm. here. Uh, we did uh, Mecklenburg Forum here and uh, Mecklenburg Online, a chance for folks to talk directly to the county manager, to talk to people who are in authority here in this community. That the politicians and such like that, it, it gives ordinary folks, anyone with a television set, an opportunity to communicate directly with the leaders, the movers and shakers yeah. of the community. A personal look. Here. And, yes, you know, really this has does. been a personal experience for me here tonight, remembering so many great moments that I've grown up with. And TV should be personal. That's why you can be a part. Be the eye in TVI. Make it a personal thing. Make it a personal commitment to a television station that truly belongs to all of us. Arrow and Richard... Wrap it up, fellas. What we need to do is we need to give C.J. Underwood a standing ovation here for commitment to the entire community. You know, here's a man who is battling cancer and winning, so that's a true broadcaster for you. That's commitment. That's what that is. And we need you to become committed to WTVI 371-8787. We still have lots of movie tickets to be given away from Consolidated Theaters. Credit card. You